Welcome to Econ Roots, your podcast on the roots of economic thought. I'm Stefan. And I'm Otto. Let's get on with today's conversation. Welcome once again to uh, Econ Roots, our second season, uh, where we are working over the uh, many amazing Nobel laureates in economic science. And uh, this is our Modern Macro Part 2 episode, and I am, as always, Stefan, and I am, as always, joined by... Otto. Perfect. Thank you, Otto. Are you doing good? Fine. That's good. So uh, today we, as always, have three interesting economists on the agenda. We have uh, Kirtland and Prescott, uh, who got the prize together um, in uh, 2004. And then we have the uh, um, 2006 uh, recipient, which is um, uh, Phelps. So um, we'll start with the first two. And I'll just do the, both their bios, I think, because they got the prize together and it's a similar type of contribution. And we'll talk about the contribution and, and why it's important and the serving of the prize. Um, so um, let's start with uh, with Kirtland. He's, his full name is Finn Erling Kirtland. Erling, maybe in English, I don't know. Erling, I would say in Danish, and he was Norwegian. Norwegian, Norwegian yeah. yeah. He's Norwegian. Uh, he was born on uh, December 1st, 1943. Um he, uh, they got the Nobel Prize for their contribution to dynamic macroeconomics, the time consistency of economic policy, and the driving forces behind business cycles. Um, he's Norwegian, but he worked most of his time in the United States. But before going to the United States, um, he had a liberal country farming upbringing in Norway. Um, and he actually got interested in economics because he was doing accounting for a friend who had a mink farm. And we are Danes, both Arthur and me, and any Danes listening to this episode will find that a little bit funny, I, I'm sure. <laughs> so um, he got his uh, his Bachelor of Science from um, uh, NHH in Norway in 1968 and a PhD in economics from Carnegie Mellon in 73, uh, where uh, Prescott was actually his supervisor. Um, he has a long academic career uh, with a stop at the Federal Reserve. He's been at the Humor Institution and, and so on, but has been several places. Um, moving on to uh, to Edward uh, Christian Prescott. He was born on December 26th. So he's also a December child, actually. That's kind of funny. Didn't think about that. 1940. Um, uh, he was uh, born in uh, New York, Um to Matilde Helvey Prescott and William Clyde Prescott. He uh, got a bachelor's degree in mathematics from Swarthmore College in 62 and a master's degree from Case Western Reserve University in operations research in 63 and a, uh, a PhD uh, in, uh, in economics at Carnegie Mellon University in 1967. Um, he's been uh, uh, teaching at the University of Pennsylvania, Carnegie Mellon, University of Minnesota, uh, and he um, uh, he's uh, currently at Arizona State University. He's visited a lot of other universities as well. Uh, and he's also been very active in advising economic policy um, at various levels in the US. Um, a fun little story <laughs> before we move on to the contribution is if you go to the Nobel Law, uh, uh, the, 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 the webpage of the Nobel Prize, uh, you can find various resources and we link to several of them uh, doing this uh, in our show notes. But for this prize, they actually made a, a small documentary, they call it, which is a about eight minute long video. And <laughs> uh, it's worth to watch, if nothing else, for the amazing turn of the century aesthetics <laughs> of people. But but <laughs> but there's also a quote in there that's just, it really got me smiling. It's Kirtland who says, I, I guess the question, you don't get to hear the question, but I, it must be something along the line of how is it to work with, uh, with Press Kurt? And he, and he says that, while we don't share that many personal interests, we share exactly enough that we can work together and have a beer together. And I just really love that quote. It's just so amazing. It reminded of you and me, Otto. It's, like, it's, it's exactly enough so we can stand to work together and maybe have a beer together. But that's it. Like, I really loved it. It's uh, it's good. It's what markets can do. They bring people together. So, Otto, uh, they got the contribution uh, mainly because of pointing out something about consistency, am I right? Yes. They, about consistency and the way that rules and institutions work. And they also took macroeconomics uh, a step further from, uh, uh, from we discussed Lucas the last time. 
and the rational expectations. Uh, uh, revolution in economic theory, which they are part of, and I guess it's fair to say that every, every everyone else uh, to, to speak of has been part of that uh, ever since. Um, but uh, they actually they they made a very important observation um, to begin with. Uh, if we start with with, with Lucas, uh, he was looking at uh, business cycles from uh, the demand side of the economy. So uh, he had the idea that the uh, people are on average rational, <laughs> <laughs> on average uh, they are rational, and on, and on average they have correct expectations unless there is some kind of shock to the economy which uh, will introduce a, a, a biased information, uh, source of information, or just a shock that nobody had expected. For instance, it, it could be an unforeseen monetary shock. Uh, coming from from the monetary uh, authorities, so monetary policy could be effective if, uh, said Lucas, uh, if nobody expected it. If they expected, it, then it would have no effect. Not even the the short uh, term effect uh, envisioned by by Milton Friedman and the the, the monetarists. But uh, what uh, Prescott and Kitlin uh, did was actually. St- uh, ask the question, if we look at uh, the empirical business cycles we have had, um, in, in, especially in the Western world, uh, where did they come from? And they concluded that if you look at, them, look at it empirically, uh, most of the shocks did in fact not come from the uh, demand side, but from the supply side. Mm-hmm. And so what they said was, uh, as far as we can see, uh, a majority of the shocks we have seen has been a shock to the product, to productivity. And if you shock productivity, it works very differently from, from, from shocks to the demand side. Um, and basically, if, if you have... Uh, a, if you have shock to the to, to the supply side, they will tend to be very different. From uh, all shocks can can be different, and uh, it's very difficult to do something about them uh, with economic policies. Uh, so if you want to to even if 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 demand policies were if effective, um, uh, they won't work if we are seeing a supply shock. Um, and actually, if, if one of the examples, I, I guess, was was uh, very pertinent at that time was looking bad at, at the oil crisis uh, in the 70s, where uh, a, a, a shock to the economy, we, we had a, a a shock to the economy coming from a disruption of the supply of oil, uh, and it was tried to fix by 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 increasing demand. And what you got was was uh, was inflation instead. So that was one example. Mm-hmm. A, a very recent example um, has been the shock that came from the uh, from the epidemic mm-hmm. uh, from the corona epidemic, um, and uh, which is, uh, to my mind at least, uh, a supply shock in the sense that the what the economy can supply, it can supply much less than it used to because if people don't interact as much, uh, then the economy, the, the capacity of the economy really is, is smaller. So it was a supply shock. And uh, what we saw was that... Um, uh, very clearly, all over the Western world, at least, was that when you close down the economy and when the, the virus spread, the the economics would, the economy would turn down and it would bounce back very quickly afterwards. Um, when when the uh, when the epidemic uh, weakened again, um, so that had all the characteristics of a supply shock. Even <laughs> if that was the case, <laughs> uh, the the uh, Great central banks or 
major central banks, I don't know, they're not that great. <laughs> they're, they're major, the US central bank and the European central banks, they stimulated uh, uh, the monetary policy a lot. And uh, what would you expect uh, when you answer a supply uh, shock with an increase in, 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 in demand from, from, from monetary policy? You'll expect inflation. Inflation, and that's what we are. What as we are uh, as we're taping this, we are we are seeing uh, inflation well, it's, pick up. It's just supply chain issues, so, so you know that. It's just <laughs> supply chain issues. Don't, don't, so, don't, don't stop. So, that. <laughs> so that that was very important. A very important contribution was to understand the economy uh, uh, from from the supply side, and and also to make it more uh, empirical. Mm-hmm. That's what that's what they what they did. They sometimes criticized for not being empirical enough, but actually they started out by 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 empirical studies. Uh, so that was very 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 important, and this has uh, been a major uh, step uh, in, in 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 macroeconomics. And then they they had an, an and yeah and all, had another, another con- con- yeah, but also it's. Just to build on on the major step there, it's 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 been a major step because it was it was one of the main arguments of separating away uh, central banks from from direct political control, right? Like it's it uh, the idea that we can't really trust polis- politicians to be consistent in their actions. That's, but that's another yeah right yeah that yeah. that's on the, the next uh, I think a great great uh, contribution yeah it especially has to do with consistency of economic policy. Uh, over time, and an interesting paradox. Yeah. Um, and um, what they, they they wrote in a very important paper called uh, "Rules versus Discretion." Yeah. And they ask which is best for for an authority uh, making economic policy: is it to be rule based or to have discretion? And on the face of it, uh, it makes uh, most sense to to have a dis- discretionary powers because if you're bound by rules, there's something you can't do. So if I'm not bound by rules, I can do more. So, uh, so, so it, you should expect, given the competence <laughs> of, 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 of the authority, that it would be better to have an authority uh, which was not bound by rules. But what they pointed out was that um uh, if you make policy you have to make a credible commitment if people are going to react to it in the way you expect one example is that uh if um if 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 uh, the social partners who are agreeing on the wage rate uh, wage increases if they come to expect that the monetary authority, if if they uh, increase wages, real wages, too much, and employment start unemployment start to rise, then the monetary uh, authority will step in and loosen monetary policy and create inflation. If they expect uh, uh, that to happen, it can be very difficult for the monetary. Uh, authority uh, not to do it exactly um, yeah. just like um, I, when you'd say to your children <laughs> if you do that <laughs> if you climb up that tree I'm not going to help you <laughs> and uh, your kid will know okay if I if, if, if I cry if I him. cry enough <laughs> he'll help me yeah. actually uh, you could you could be better off if you could make the uh, your kid believe that you wouldn't. Yeah, exactly. Uh, wouldn't help yeah. them because then they wouldn't climb out the tree to begin with. Yeah, and that basic that's uh, that's actually how a lot of parents get their kids dressed in the morning. Right? They say, "Well, it's not my rules; it's a school rule, right?" Like you know, it's like yeah. you know, it's not me forcing you. It's exactly, just, it's a school rule, right? And okay, right? No point arguing with dad over that, right? Yeah, exactly. Yeah. And uh, um, so, so, so if you are bound by some rule, that can make your policy more uh, believable believable, and you can have a stronger commitment. Yeah. And as you mentioned, 
this insight led to the creation of independent um, uh, central banks yeah. Yeah. in many countries. And they, they, of course, they had they had the mandate. The mandate was to secure price stability um, in, in the best cases and nothing else. Yeah. And then uh, the uh, the agents of the economy would know that the the central bank is not going to to help us out if we get in trouble. Yeah. So we better not climb <laughs> climb, up, climb the up the tree because we're going to get down on our own. Oh. And and basically this this was uh, the insight of rules versus discretion. Yeah. That you have to 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 realize that the the it is a little bit like like Lucas inside that uh, uh, the the agent is not divorced from from the model, but there is an interaction, uh, and the policymaker is not divorced from from from, uh, from the behavior of agents, as in the Lucas yeah. critique we talked about. It's a the, the same thing here that the policymaker is not divorced from the economy. It's not some god he also coming lives down there. from heaven uh, bidding, uh, uh, bidding people to do something and then disappears. But there is a, an interaction between policymakers and 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 uh, and agents in the economy. And if you take that into account, uh, it, it it makes sense. Yeah. Um, and if you're we were going to talk to talk about uh, game theory later yeah, in another um, episode. Yeah. Uh, and uh, and if you if you apply game theory, it becomes very uh, obvious why it very often is 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 a good idea to be tied to the mast yeah. rather than have uh, a free hand in everything because the other people can 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 use that yeah. uh, against you. Exactly. Exactly. Um, I think they're interesting scholars. I think, like, again, they are very relatable to Lucas as well. Like, like in average, people are pretty good at deciding when times are good and bad. But, of course, macro policy can have such a big impact that if that is random or arbitrary or something, it's going to be very hard for people's expectations to form rationally. Uh, another contribution that they made that I think we owe them to to talk about before, at least mention, um, before, um, before moving on to Phelps, is... Uh, is that they actually are, uh, are very good at fo- putting focus on the impact of technology as well, right? Uh, and this is important in, in macroeconomics. One of the debates that we haven't talked so much about, but which is really important for modern macro, is the idea of micro foundations, right? Like, to what degree should macroeconomic models match microeconomic models, basically, right? Does something happen when we go to the accurate or not, right? Or is it basically the same thing? Um, Hayek was very skeptical of the whole concept of a macro economy. He thought like, you know, it, it's it's all macro, it's all micro basically, right? And other people have said, no, there's something else that's happening. And one can, no matter where you are in that discussion, uh, they have, their work has also been very good at actually showing how technology also changes uh, exactly. um, um, these both uh, expectation forming and consistency in policy and so on and, and what's so so that's worth mentioning as well I think so yeah and I think this is your point is, is is very important that that the interaction between the microeconomy and the macroeconomy is uh, is if, if it should not be uh, separated yeah, it, exactly it should be integrated exactly uh, and we started to some extent we started out the wrong way and especially in Keynes and some Keynesians had the idea that there was a, you could see the, the macro economy as a relationship between macro uh, variables not taking uh, individuals uh, action into account Um and if if you don't da- do that, you don't really understand the economy. Yeah. And what the rational ex- expectations uh, people really did was said, no, no, we have to understand this as 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 as, as an economy working like uh, it does when we're talking about microeconomics and standard markets and things like that, and then explain how can we have business cycles. Yeah, exactly. So, Exactly, and I think, of course, you can take these arguments far out, and uh, and it's also 
where we closely borders on philosophy and so on. But as you're saying, there's a there's a methodologically point. Are you going top down or bottom up? Basically, right? But I actually also think some of the more out there arguments is really interesting to listening to. Like um, if you were at a at a talk with a financial economist and and they sometimes would model and not so much anymore, I think. But in the past, they sometimes model like stock. Uh, prices as random walks, right? And I also found that was a dubious argument because, well, these are caused by human actions and humans can't be irrational. Like, we, we can't be random in that sense. It doesn't, I cannot decide to do a random walk. Like, it, it, it won't be random. <laughs> I can't do it. Like, I can, my, my head can be hurt and I can fall down or, or take a couple of steps because I'm in an accident, but I cannot decide to be, uh, be irrational in this sense. And I think a lot of like discussions, around rationality it reflects that. And I, it is a fundamental discussion in economics still. I, I think it, it has, interestingly, uh, has uh, given economists a much needed uh, degree of humility. Yes, exactly. Uh, humility about what we can do, Yeah. Uh, how much we can know about the future, yeah. and uh, how much we can influence it by yeah. economic policy. And it's clear that if you if you understand uh the economy as as uh, very mechanistic um and don't realize that 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 agents will react to what you do yeah. <laughs> um then 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 uh, you'll you'll make uh, a mistake because yeah. uh um because they do yeah and They, and they use the the information they have as good as they can, but they make mistakes. And that means that really, when you're making predictions, uh, in my in my view, you can you can predict sort of the the, the uh, some structural effects of, of doing something, and and of course you can. What's this interesting is looking at situations where rational people. Uh, Not necessarily do anything. Yeah, uh, yeah. Uh, but but if they have an inten- incentive to do something, then you shouldn't uh, assume that they won't do it. Yeah. Um, and that means that when you're when you, you uh, when you're forecasting the economy, it's much much harder to do because basically what economists who think they can forecast the economy what they're doing is that they're assuming that people are making the same mistakes uh consistently over time yeah and uh and and why should they you are listening to econ roots your podcast on the history of economic thought thank you for joining the conversation But there's also an interesting link here over to um, to two other schools that we're going to return to in later episodes. First of all, public choice, right? One of the main Keynesian critiques from public choice is that we shouldn't judge policy based on intentions, but on consequences. Because most, I mean, and most like Keynesian policymakers have the best intentions in the world, probably not all of them, but many of them probably do. Uh, but if the same as other people would have good intentions, but if the consequences are bad, then that's what we should judge on because that's what we can measure and see uh, and actually uphold, right? I, I mean, I can I can always say I want to be a good guy, but if I go out and rob an old lady, I am not a good guy. Like I had the best intentions, but my actions did something else. Another thing is is relatable to uh, to behavioral economics, which we'll talk about later, because a big discussion in behavioral economics is. Is the idea about predictive or explanatory power of models, right? And and that also sort of goes back to the whole idea of micro foundations. Like, do should we evaluate models if they're good at explaining past behavior or predicting future behavior, and uh, or is it either or and so on? So, dear listeners, lots to look forward to. But time is running fast, right? And we know time is the ultimate li- scarce resource, so we should uh, we should move <laughs> on now. So, uh, so um, our last staff today is uh, uh, Edmund Strother Phelps. Uh, he was born on July 26, uh, 1933. Um, and he was born, uh, born in uh, Everston, Illinois, but he moved with his family to Hastings and Hudson in New York when he was six. So I guess he's probably more of a New York person. Um, he went in 1951 to Amherst College uh, for his undergraduate education. 
And um, there, uh, following his father's advice as well, uh, fathers are important for economists. Is some of the stuff I've learned here. So uh, <laughs> doing the bio research for opera, uh, they um, he uh, he enrolled in their economic e- economics courses, um, and there he was taught by uh, James Nelson uh, with the economics uh, textbook by Paul Samuelson. So. Um, um, he got his uh, Bachelor of Arts at Amherst in 1955, went to Yale University for graduate sc- studies, uh, and un- there he actually um, studied um, under um, James Tobin, who we talked about in the last episode, right? And another Small Nobel Laureate. <laughs> yeah, sorry. <laughs> Small world. Small world. <laughs> and another uh, future Nobel Laureate, Thomas uh, Schelling, uh, among a lot of other uh, distinguished economists at the time. Um he was strongly uh, influenced by William Fellner, um, uh, who actually talked a lot about the expectation of agents. That's a lot of what his work is about. Um, and he finally got his PhD in 1959, and he got the Nobel Prize. Um, uh, and in 19, uh, sorry, in, in 2006, and the motivation was for his analysis of intertemporal trade-offs in macroeconomic policy. Um, and. Uh, he has had an, an insane research career and focused on many, many things. He's a very well-rounded and uh, involved scholar. And um, if you look at his Wikipedia page, they try to the one way to, to look at his legacy of work is to look at it by decades, which is interesting. Right? Like most most other things, if, if you look at at any kind of encyclopedia, be it Wikipedia or uh, Encyclopedia Britannica or somewhere else, or some of the economic ones. They would be like by subject or something like that. But you just put it in by decade, which I thought was funny. So, why is he the star of the show today, Otto? Well, he is one star. One star, uh, yes. Uh, one star. Not the star, but he's he one is, of the stars. He's right? so, yeah. is, is one star. Um, I think it, uh, more than one reason. Mm-hmm. Uh, he was important for the development of macroeconomics because he realized along with Milton Friedman that the the idea behind the Phillips curve was wrong. Yeah. Uh, We discussed it when we discussed uh, Milton Friedman and and, and monetarism, Uh, but what they both realized was that uh, the Phillips curve is the idea that there's a trade-off between inflation and unemployment. Yeah. And... uh, Friedman showed in his way, uh, and Pres- uh, and uh, uh, Phelps did it uh, somewhat differently, but also came to the same conclusion that uh, any fall in the unemployment rate because of an increase in in uh, inflation can only be temporary, because once uh, people realize that um, that what you're seeing is not an increase in, in real wages or an increase in in, in, in profits, yeah. but basically just inflation, uh, then you will uh, revert to the old level, the natural rate of unemployment as, as it was uh, as it is called. Uh, so so he, ri- he realized that and realized that the the the, the way the the, the the Keynesian model was uh, Keynesian theory was uh, practiced <laughs> at his time was simply wrong. Yeah, and uh, so uh, so that was 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 important. Uh, of course, he's not as famous as, as Milton Friedman, uh, but he was uh, along Milton Friedman in in realizing that uh, there was a problem with the with 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 the uh, Phillips curve and. Um, so that's that's one important uh, one th- important thing to to mention. Another important thing to mention is that some of his ideas really have had impact on what we call uh, New Keynesian theory. Mm-hmm. And New Keynesian theory um, is basically uh, it is is uh, Keynesian uh, Keynesianism accepting. First of all, rational expectations, and also uh, real business cycle effects, yeah. as we have talked about. So, 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 so they accept 
that both things are true. They don't. It's not I, just animal spirits. No. Yeah. Uh, so that's much much different. But their focus is on 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 why markets might not adjust uh, as quickly, um, and what you can do do about yeah. it. And can is there a possibility if we have a market failure of some kind, prices don't work enough that the economy would be caught in, in in an equilibrium and can you move that equilibrium or in an inferior equilibrium and you can you move that equilibrium by by economic policy so it's it's much more uh, modest yeah. uh, than the original idea that that the economist could sit at at his uh, keyboard and uh, control the economy uh, completely and the best managed demand and then the economy would would be in balance and there wouldn't be any uh, <laughs> uh, business cycles so the world would be good um yeah and it's um uh, it, but they still have this idea so they moved away uh new keynesians from the idea of social engineering but they still have like a, a normative approach to what you should do with the economy right i mean they open up for the fact that you you can have normative political standards like lowering equality or whatever inequality sorry or something like that but um i think i think one of the things that phelps uh, is actually good at also taking from keynes because i i don't want to i don't want to diss keynes too much i actually think he was a really interesting scholar and and well worth reading but we also all know that that he died in 46 right and uh, if he had lived 10 years longer, like the intellectual history of our field would like to have been changed a lot, right? To, to say the least. Uh, but one of the things that Keynes was actually very open on, uh, which Phelps uh, also continues on, and which other economists like Frank Knight was very focused on, was like uncertainty of policy, right? And uncertainty of the market, uncertainty of the world, and how that is not necessarily a bad thing, right? If you ask Frank Knight, it's actually a very good thing, right? Uh, Keynes probably thought it was a bad thing, as he goes back and forth, but he's very open on it. I think uh, Phelps is somewhat in the middle, right? But he's very open for the fact that uncertainty is a real part of economic policy and economic research, right? Um, yeah. Yeah. Um, one thing I also think that is, and, and maybe because of that, it's um, he's also, when he gets the Nobel Prize in 2006, he talks a lot about entrepreneurship and he still does that today. And this is a really interesting intellectual history point because the, the idea of entrepreneurship and the entrepreneur had more or less left economics by the turn of the 20th century. Nobody really talked about it. And then we have this resurgence and this revolution led by people like Shane and at MIT and uh, but also a lot of the Austrians uh, in business schools around the world uh, we have Nikolai Foss here in Denmark uh, and other people uh, but he was he's actually also very focused on that right that 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 entrepreneurship is actually very important and something we should focus more on right um what do you think the relationship between macroeconomics and entrepreneurship should be well we discussed uh, uh, real business cycles a moment ago and of course uh, what uh, Prescott and Gitlin realized was that the technological shocks had played a very important role yeah. for the cycles we have seen um, in, in in history um, so they have opened the door yeah. I think to a large extent to yeah. entrepreneurship and uh, somewhat differently, but uh, somewhat akin mm -hmm. to Schumpeter, yeah, exactly. who also believed that that uh, the cycles in the economy was driven by entrepreneurial discoveries. Um, Aspirations and so, yeah. Exactly. Yeah. Um, so I think that, that there is an interesting connection and I think that uh, we talked about in the very early episode uh, about the Austrian school uh, and the interesting thing is that the Austrian school is so focused on entrepreneurship but have uh, haven't uh, integrated it in their originally in their business cycle theory yeah and uh, I think that actually if you look at it, uh, real business cycle theory is 
uh, augmenting uh, some of, of the insights by the by the early Austrians yeah. uh, and perhaps giving a better better model for for, for, for why we have business cycles. Yeah. Uh, the idea that business cycles are are systematic uh, was perhaps uh, a misunderstanding. Um, also shared by the by the Austrians that yeah. what we see is a lot of shocks. Oh yeah, exactly. <laughs> the economy exactly. and they're coming yeah. all all the time from different angles. And basically, this is how the Austrians describe the markets going yeah. on. A lot of shocks, to change dynamic process. Uh, yeah. Exactly. Yeah, so you have this process, and actually, what they managed to do is to to integrate this uh, in 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 the uh, in the macro economy yeah. in a way that the that the the Austrians didn't do. Yeah, I think that's a good point. And uh, in, in fact, maybe the chain of evidence also runs the other way. I don't remember if we talked about this. We might have talked about this in an early episode. But obviously, if you have an artificially set interest rate or or uh, 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 and not sustainable money supply and so on, certain entrepreneurial ventures will look more profitable than they actually are, right? And that's, of course, what drives a lot of business cycle, the, the malinvestments, as Hayek would call it, right? Uh, and uh, uh, But even without that, even if, if everything's fine, we're still going to have malinvestments because that's what entrepreneurship is, is yes. going out discovering, right? Phelps has this uh, quote, and there's an interview with him when he gets the prize where he says, you you can't have an exciting life if we don't accept uncertainty. And that's so true. Um, I also think going back to Kitlan and Prescott's point about technology, it's really interesting. I was doing some reflections early on that if we're taking, if, if we read Weplin way back, Weplin and his uh, theory on the leisure class, uh, which take it or leave it or whatever, but, but one meta point or whatever from that is that if you get to be affluent economically speaking you get to have leisure time right i mean even the word school actually comes from the word for leisure time many people don't realize but both in greek and latin it's yeah. exactly, it's derived from that yeah because if, if you're out there working in the fields all day you don't have time for school right like you know you need a certain level of prosperity for that and uh, and if we look forward like uh, my generation, when we were young, we were bored a lot of the time, right? Because we were not no longer expected to work in the household, we weren't expected to get jobs, but the technology had not yet catched up to a point where it's actually something for us to do. So like lots of times we were just really <laughs> bored, right? So so my generation was used to being bored. I think anybody who was a kid in the eighties would, would would remember that feelings. Where you, I look at my kids now, they're never bored. They don't know how to be bored because they know there's like instant twenty four hour streaming service, entertainment, all that kind of stuff. So that will obviously influence how they will go to the world, go to the uh, labor market, and all these kind of things, right? Um, because maybe being born bored is what makes you able to have a job, actually, right? Because a job can be boring from time to time. I don't know. This is going uh, way off topic, but it's interesting. Uh, that's an interesting observation. Though. It's interesting, right? Like technology definitely plays into this, uh, and technology is inherently uncertain. And and a good macroeconomics is probably, and it, I, I think Phil would agree with that, but but please challenge me. Is probably something that can contain uncertainty in a good way, right? It, it must be able to, yeah, exactly. contain uh, uncertainty because uh, it, 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 it's a fact of life. Uh, we have uncertainty, and uncertainty is also an important uh, source of uh, instability. Yeah. <laughs> so and wealth uh, generation. It's a both. Uh, it's a double-sided coin, right? Yeah. But that's a big change from the Keynesianism of the past which one is stability and and also for that matter, the monetarism, like the acceptance that actually uncertainty is something that is a built-in feature, it's not a bug. It's probably like- Well, it can be both. It's it both, be both, right, right. It's not, it's, it's a double-sided oh, coin, uh, but yeah. That, uh, um, Jean-Peter's point was that we should have to accept, uh, that we should accept the business cycles because the, that was uh, a necessary part of having entrepreneurship. So, 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 yeah. so we should we should uh, should accept it. Um, and 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 this is so interesting. How Sean Peter was the PhD advisor of Tobin, and Tobin is in a, uh, um, has uh, has taught uh, Phelps and so on. So it's it's interesting how maybe these small nuggets of of insights can not sometimes travel through generations, right? So I, I think that's that's cool. But, but they don't travel unchanged. No, they don't. Really, really no, no, they change. Though, we're talking about. Um, before we end today, I think this has been a really good conversation. Um, 
I'd actually like to read Phelps, the last of the conclusion to Phelps' noble uh, uh, speech and talk a little bit about that because I think it's a really interesting point. So he, ha- he ends it with saying, it's his lecture, his Nobel lecture, just to be precise here. My conclusion is that morally acceptable economy must have enough di- dynamism to make work amply engaging and rewarding and have enough justice if dynamism alone cannot do the job to secure ample inclusion. That's a it's it's that's a pretty bold statement to say that, that that's like the aim of, of at least macroeconomy. Like what 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 would you say to this statement? Well I think if if you look at the relative importance of dynamism and uh what he's really talking about is redistribution. Yeah, it is. Uh, yeah, that's, uh, I think that's what he refers to as what, justice. What right? is creation? What is what is creating uh, safety and well-being and so on? Is the fact that we have allowed a lot of uh, dynamism? Yes, exactly. So, so, so that that's where it all comes from. You can't if, if you don't have a rich economy you have uh, very little to redistribute from so yeah. but of course also it's of course a political point of view should should it be an aim of, of government to redistribute or or not yeah. um, i mean this is definitely not a value free view of economic science no this is definitely a value based view of it, economic science right yes. and uh, it actually it's it, it's an interesting point of view because it's the it's a point of view saying we should accept uh a, a something which is a cost to society yeah actually if you look at it in, in purely formal terms uh redistribution and pollution <laughs> uh works the same way yeah in an economic analysis and but what you're really saying here is that we should live with some of the negative consequences of redistribution because we want it for political reasons should we do that or should we not? Which role should it play is is an entirely different and and uh, question, but it's not uninformed by economic theory. Um, so actually, some of the political philosophers uh, right now uh, were discussing this fifty years ago. Uh, John Rawls, and oh, yeah. Robert Nozick, and both were uh, students of of economics. Um, I think it, 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 we, uh, Rawls was very widely read in, in, in economics and uh, uh, Nozick has had an exceptional deep understanding of, of economics. Yeah, actually, um, without being too into that body of uh, Phelps' work, I know he has written quite a lot on, on, uh, on Rawls. And I think his exactly. point is that economists should uh, listen to Rawls' concept of fairness. Right, there should be an element of fairness. So even if a policy is, let's say, it's optimum for whatever point of view we set up, uh, if it's unfair, we should be open to that argument, which f- can be maybe from a strictly scientific point of view, a uh, slippery slope, right? Because what is fairness? And this was the same kind of arguments against Rawls. Uh, but at the same time, it can also be, you know, Maybe some would say it's more humane or it's even maybe more political practical that there are certain type of policies that are simply, even if they are more efficient, uh, too unfair to politically, realistically get, get through, right? So um, this is also another reason why I think this quote is so interesting is actually in the um, – in the last episode, we we quoted Tobin, where he referred to something that Jean Peter said again <laughs> about why economic it, 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 why economic science and policy and even ideology is so closely linked together, right? And in a way, he's building onto that heritage. He's in Phelps' view is admitting that it this is how it should be, right? It's you should admit that you have an ideological goal with uh, uh, with pursuing economics, uh, both in science and practice, right? I mean, you can agree with it or not, but uh, like the goal. But but I mean, I, at least he's it's a clear flag, right? So yeah. yes, yes, and uh, of course you could you can say that if if you want to advance an economic policy agenda, yeah, then it, you you it must have a normative uh, uh, element to it. Yeah, you can you can you can from you can't ad- advance come up with an advice uh, if you don't have that. So yeah. it is 
important as a background, but it doesn't mean that the theory in itself is is informed by uh, yeah. by by norm, a normative point of view. Of course, uh, the way that individual scientists uh, go about their science is influenced by 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 the world they live in, yeah. including the world of ideas uh, about uh, how the society should work they're living in. Yeah. But that's not the same as to say that the science in itself is just uh, a, a, the just the political ideas. Yeah. So. No, no, definitely not. And I actually think in 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 you you said it really well. You said if if you have no work, no dynamism, you have no wealth creation, then you have nothing to redistribute, and and then you can have all the ideas you want about redistribution, but but they don't, they won't matter, right? And he's also in this demonstrating um, uh, an ordinal or whatever you would call it goal, uh, like uh, ranking of the goals here, right? Like he says that like uh, you should only do this if dynamism can't do it alone, right? He's still like he's markets first, right? Like let's let's try with markets, and I think this is where he's he's definitely a science guy and not a politician, right? Because many politicians, because they control the state and so on, they would like to start with state intervention, at least in Denmark, right, uh, where we're from, uh, where he's saying uh, in this quote alone, it's a, I really like the quote, right? It's, he's saying like, if there's a room for state intervention, it's only if dynamism can't do it alone, right? And then, of course, we could return to a discussion about the time that we had last time, short term, long term, and all that. That's a whole discussion in itself. But it's interesting. It's really funny. Um, I think we should end it here. Would you agree? Perfect. Well, thank you, dear listeners, for spending time with us. Uh, we hope this gave you some food for thoughts. And uh, until next time, hope you'll stay rational. Thank you so much for spending your valuable time with us exploring the history of economic thought. You are welcome to email comments and suggestions to stefan at cpas.dk. Please like and share and recommend this podcast anywhere you can and think it's relevant. Until next time, stay rational. Yeah.